Hello, my name is Dr. Pamela Young. I work for the Australian Center for Microscopy and Microanalysis, and today I'm going to be talking to you about actual microscopes. Quick overview, I will be uh, begin by talking about bright field microscopes, um, and then I'll talk about fluorescence microscopes, confocal microscopes, and some advanced fluorescence techniques. I'm not going to spend much time on the bright field microscope. If you'd like to learn more about the bright field microscope, please go back and um, uh, watch our talk on basic microscopy by Courtney Wright. So just a quick reminder of the bright field microscope. The bright field microscope has a light source, typically a halogen lamp. Um, the condenser focuses the light from that halogen lamp onto the sample. Um, and then the objective magnifies the sample. It captures the light and magnifies the sample, uh, typically anywhere from four to 100 times, typical objectives used in a um, bright field microscope. And then um, at the eyepiece or in front of the camera, there's typically an additional 10x magnification so that you get um, anywhere from 40 to um, 1,000x image of the specimen, whether it be the image that you see with your eye or captured by the camera. So as I said, that was going to be quick. I'm going to now start talking about flu the fluorescence microscope. Um, if you need a reminder about the principles of fluorescence, please go back and um, watch the talk by uh, Eleanor Cable on um, principles of fluorescence. So I'm going to start by going through the light path of the fluorescence microscope. So um, if you remember what I just said about the bright field microscope, the light is uh, focused by the condenser. In the fluorescence microscope, we don't use any of that light path on the condenser side. Um, we're only going to use the, um, the epi light path, uh, which on this microscope is just the top half of the microscope. Um, on an inverted microscope, is just the bottom half of the microscope. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So here's a schematic of the fluorescence microscope. Uh, what you can see is that the light path is entirely on the objective side, the epi side of the microscope. So we've got the, um, the bright arc lamp that uh, will excite um, with typically a uh, very bright white light source. Um, that light's going to get um, then um, directed to the fluorescence filter cube. Um, typically, there's some sort of excitation filter then to select some uh, relevant short wavelengths for your sample based on the fluorophores labeling your sample. Um, inside that fluorescence filter cube, there's also going to be a, a dichroic mirror. Usually, it is a long pass, so long wavelengths of light will um, pass through the dichroic mirror and short wavelengths uh, will be reflected. And so you can see the short, these short wavelengths, these blue wavelengths of light are now being reflected down um, through the objective to focus the light onto the specimen. Uh, the specimen will then be excited by these short wavelengths of light and fluoresce at a longer wavelength. Um, it'll fluoresce in all 360 degrees. Um, some of that light will be captured by the objective and then uh, directed Back through the microscope, because it is now these longer wavelengths of light, it will pass through the filter cube, it will not be reflected by the filter cube, and be directed up to the camera or to the eyepiece. So let's talk about each of those components in detail. I'm going to start by talking about the light source, then I'll talk through some filters, objectives, uh, and the camera. So what are some common light sources in fluorescence microscopy? You can see in the schematic it just generically says arc lamp. Um, but there are quite a few, so obviously a, an arc mercury lamp is a very common one. Um, the newer version of that being the metal halide lamp, um, as well as xenon lamps, um, and LEDs are now coming into the field. It's a very, very popular um, light source for fluorescence microscopy, and I'm going to talk about each of these in detail. So the mercury lamp is sort of the traditional bright light source for fluorescence microscopy. Um, it has a metal um, bulb um, that uh, is very, very, very bright, 10 to 100 times brighter than a typical um, halogen bulb. Um, but uh, as you can see in the spectrum, it's got quite a few, um, it's not just a, a uniform white light source, it's got quite a few excitation peaks, if you will. Um, so um, 
that can be good and bad depending on what you're trying to excite. If you're trying to excite something um, uh, two fluorophores and you want to use similar excitation power, that's going to be a problem uh, with a mercury lamp. Um, but if you're just trying to get a nice uh, bright signal, um, this will work very well for you. Um, typical mercury lamps live for about 200 hours, then you need to replace them. Um, also, um, they get very hot, so you need to give your lamp plenty of time to warm up without turning it off again. And once it's off, plenty of time to cool down before you turn it on again, or you can burst that bulb and um, cleaning up mercury is no fun for anybody. Um, more popular now is a metal halide lamp. Uh, the metal halide lamps, you can see, have very similar spectra to the mercury lamp, um, but they're a little bit nicer than a mercury lamp because typically they've got um, a light fiber guide making um, uh, alignment pretty, pretty trivial. Um, they have extremely long lifetimes, more than 2,000 hours, then you get to replace the bulb. Um, and um, keeps the heat away from the microscope, as well as uh, there's typically not quite as long of a warm-up and cool-down time. Um, you can't flip it on and off quite like a light switch, but five to ten minutes is generally sufficient uh, to flip on and flip off a metal halide lamp. Another common fluorescence light source is the xenon lamp. Um, you can see from the spectrum straight away that the xenon lamp has um, uh, far fewer peaks than the mercury lamp. Um, this is particularly important if you're doing like FURA 2 imaging, which requires max, matched excitation power um, at 340 and 380 nanometer excitation wavelengths for that fast switching. Um, this lamp also is very temperature dependent, so you need to give it a nice long warm up time and cool down time like the mercury lamp. Um, what's becoming a lot more common these days is to use um, uh, a solid state epi-illumination source. So um, a lot of my microscopes have the, the Sola, uh, Sola SE2 from LumenCore. It um, uh, mostly incorporates LED light sources um, in order to create um, a nice white light source. Uh, you can see in the spectrum um, below that it does have peaks similar to a metal halide or a mercury lamp, um, but it still gives you a nice, a nice broad, um, fair, fairly white light source. Um, it's a lot more stable and quantitative than a conventional mercury lamp. Um, it's got a very long life, so you don't have to worry about changing bulbs. Um, requires zero warm-up and cool-down time, no maintenance required, so you can just flip it on off like a light switch, which is very, very nice. Um, we also have systems that use the LumenCore Spectra X LED light engine. Um, this is another one that's nice. You can flip on and off like a light switch, long life. You're not changing bulbs all the time. Um, what's neat about the Spectra X is that instead of being a white light source, it's actually um, uh, individual wavelengths of light. It isn't a white light source that you can actually um, you can turn off these individual uh, wavelengths of light without using excitation filters. It all comes right from the light source, um, which is fantastic. So um, it enables simultaneous excitation um, of multiple wavelengths without having to use anything like a, like a filter wheel. You can just turn on straight from the light source your, um, your blue excitation and your green excitation simultaneously. Um, so if you have two cameras on a system or um, something like that, you're able to uh, get that multiple excitation, um, which is, uh, can be really useful for some experiments. <laughs> So those are some common light sources for fluorescence microscopy. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the filters. So the fluorescence filter cube is kind of the, the crux of fluorescence microscopy. It's how we separate that excitation light from the emission light. So very commonly is just a basic uh, filter cube. Um, it's got the excitation filter, the dichroic mirror, and the emission filter. Um, you can see we've got that nice uh, transmission graph there that shows um, where the excitation filter transmits light, where the emission filter transmits light, uh, and where the dichroic mirror uh, transmits light. So it's very obvious that your excitation filter is letting, um, let's say, 450 to 500 nanometer light pass. Um, the dichroic mirror is specifically reflecting at those wavelengths and transmitting pretty much everywhere else. 
Um, and then the emission filter is um, choosing just those emission wavelengths from about, let's say, 500 to 550 um, to, to reach the camera. So if you do have multiple fluorophores in your sample um, that happen to be excited between um, 450 and 500, only the emissions that fall in that 500 to 550 range will actually reach the camera. And so you'll just then take a picture of that, that specific fluorophore. Um, you can buy very fancy dichroics. Um, so you could get a triple dichroic like this dichroic here um, that would pass um, something like uh, 488, 543, and maybe 633 light um, uh, down to the sample. Um, and then all of the other wavelengths of light would then um, get transmitted up to the camera. Um, this can be really useful if you don't want to have to have any moving parts. So if you don't want to have to move multiple filter cubes into place uh, when you capture your image, you just want to leave one filter cube in place. Um, and then all you have to move is your um, excitation filter um, and or emission filter in and out of place. And so you can take a triple dichroic mirror like that and combine it um, with a dual or triple uh, excitation filter, a dual or triple emission filter, and make some really fancy filter sets. Uh, so if you look at the transmission graph on the left, you can see it, it looks like a, a, a triple dichroic mirror uh, was set up in a filter cube in combination with um, an excitation filter uh, that will excite uh, both DAPI and FITSI, if you look at the red curves, um, and then an emission filter uh, that will collect the emissions of both DAPI and FITSI if you then look at the, the white curves. Um, so you'll be able to see both of those fluorophores simultaneously when you look down the eyepieces, um, or you can capture uh, an image of both of them simultaneously. Um, and then on the right, uh, you can see we've taken um, a triple dichroic mirror and set it up so that you can actually um, uh, excite DAPI, FITSI, and TRITSI all simultaneously. Again, looking at those red curves, um, you can see your DAPI excitation, your FITSI excitation, and your TRITSI excitation. Um, and then um, the um, a triple emission filter is in place so that you can capture that DAPI emission, the FITSI emission, and the TRITSI emission, again, simultaneously. So you can look down the eyepiece and see your blue, green, and red simultaneously or capture them with the camera simultaneously. Um, pros and cons. So the pro of that obviously is speed, that you can see those things at the exact same time. Um, but the big con uh, would be any sort of spectral crossover, um, as you uh, you learned about in the uh, Principles of Fluorescence talk. And um, you'll spend a lot of time thinking about that spectral crossover when you do the fluorescence tutorial. Um, and then if you want to get really, really fancy um, with your filter arrangements, you can actually use um, filter wheels, um, whether that be um, an excitation filter wheel, a dichromatic mirror filter wheel, or an emission filter wheel, or some combination of the three, um, so that you can actually do uh, some, some fast switching. Um, and what that enables you to do then is to um, get that nice spectral separation um, but still um, uh, collect your images fairly, fairly quickly in time. Um, so um, you might use an excitation filter wheel for something like your Fira 2 work, where you need that fast switching between 340 and 380 nanometer excitation. Um, you might use an emission filter wheel for fast collection, like in a FRET experiment, or um, to clean up the spectral separation uh, from like a dual di dichroic mirror. Um, where you can just do that fast switching so that you see your, um, your two fluorophores fairly close together in time for looking at, uh, at dynamic events, live cells, and things. Okay, now I want to take a bit of time to talk about objectives. I know we talked about objectives a little bit in the basic microscopy talk with Courtney Wright, but um, objectives really are probably the most important part of the microscope, so I really want to spend some time talking about them. Um, they aren't just about, you know, magnifying the object. They do a lot more than that. They also, you know, collect the light. Um, so if your sample is very dim, you're going to need an objective that captures as much of that light um, as possible to direct up to the camera. Um, also, um, they're going to be uh, what determines the resolution of your final image. So 
going to spend a bit of time on these objectives. Um, so you can see in our little schematic the uh, where the objective sits. It's the closest part of the microscope to your sample, usually within anywhere from 100 microns from your sample to maybe four millimeters away from your sample, something along that range. Um, so, so what does the objective do? It gathers light from the sample, which is then focused to create an image at the eye um, and the camera. And so you can see here in this little diagram of an objective, the objective has a lot of information written on it. And I'm going to kind of talk through um, each of each of the different numbers and pieces of information on an objective lens for you. So the the number you're probably most used to thinking about when you think about an objective is the magnification. The magnification determines how large the image will be. Most microscopes have a 10x lens in front of the eyepiece and camera, so whatever the value is written on the objective, uh, typically multiply that by 10, and that tells you um, what your final image magnification will be. Um, if you're ever curious about um, the size uh, of your, your sample, you can always throw a, um, a calibration slide on your, on your microscope, and then you can um, get a good idea of uh, how that magnification works with the other optical elements in the microscope um, and the camera to determine what the pixel size in your image will actually be. Um, so just because, you know, you're using a 60x lens and, you know, you've got a 10x magnifier in front of your camera, that doesn't necessarily mean um, that you can then deduce that your final image size is 600x. You really do need to do this calibration. Okay, now the number that I think is probably actually the most important number on the microscope objective is the numerical aperture. So it determines how much light the objective is going to collect um, which in turn determines the resolving power of the objective. And also in the case of fluorescence microscopy, um, it will contribute to how, how bright your sample looks. Um, it's not the only thing, but um, higher numerical aperture uh, lenses will capture more of that fluorescent light and direct more light to the camera, which can be really helpful. So how is numerical aperture defined? Um, it is... Uh, related to the refractive index um, of the, um, that the light's traveling through. So in the case of an air lens, the refractive index is just one, but sometimes you'd use um, like a water immersion lens or an oil immersion lens, um, in which case that refractive index would be 1.33 or 1.51. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot more about that later. Um, uh, so it's the refractive index times the sine of the, uh, that capture angle theta, as you can see in the diagram there. Um, so the higher the NI, the higher theta, the more light that you're going to be capturing. So what does this look like practically? So here are three images that I captured using a, uh, 60X lens. The first one was with a 60X with an NA of 0 0.95. Um, the middle image was with a 60X with an NA of 1.2. And the image on the right was collected with a 60X with an NA of 1.4. Um, the only changes I made other than swapping objectives was I did have to decrease my exposure time to the camera because the image got significantly brighter um, as I swapped uh, objectives, as you would expect, by using a higher NA lens, which therefore captures more light. Um, you need to turn down your camera settings. You can also see that the image quality looks improved um, in the image that was, um, has the highest NA, uh, and that comes, that comes around to resolution. Um, that's because we are capturing um, the image with a higher resolution uh, than the 60x with an NA of 0 0.95. So this in turn uh, determines the resolution of the microscope. Um, and so what do we mean when we say resolution? So resolution is your ability to distinguish two, um, two small objects. Um, and so that is uh, what's even more important than magnification is the resolution of your image. Um, and so what you can see here in this diagram is, um, you know, a very, very small object, a uh, small point of light um, uh, will be diffracted. And therefore, instead of looking like just a small circle and in the image, it will have uh, these diffraction rings. Um, and therefore, when you get two small objects very close together, they look like a single object. Um, and so how do we determine um, that that? Uh, resolution distance typically it's around 
Um, the full width half maximum of your small object was the resolution of, uh, of the microscope, um, but we can calculate it uh, with the equation 0 0.61 times the emission wavelength divided by the numerical aperture um, of the, the microscope. So if you do um, imaging with very short wavelengths and you use very high NA objectives, uh, you will get the best resolution um, in your image which is um, what we are generally uh, attempting to achieve in microscopy. In microscopy, we talk a lot about resolution, um, and that's because um, depending on the resolution you need in your images is going to um, determine which microscopy technique you will use um, to do your, uh, your um, microscopy experiment. So the eye can resolve down to about 0.1 millimeter, which is why we have to turn to microscopy in order to um, uh, gather data about very small objects. Um, light microscopy can image down to about 0.2 microns. Um, there are some super resolution light microscopy techniques that I'll mention very briefly at the end of this talk. They can get down to about 50 nanometer resolution. Um, and then um, you might have to turn to um, an electron microscopy technique like scanning EM, which has three nanometer resolution, or transmission electron microscopy, which has about 0.2 nanometer resolution. Um, those go far outside the scope of this talk, however. Uh, and resolution in light microscopy is limited by diffraction, as I mentioned. Um, and so that really hinders the ability to obtain any sort of perfect image. Continuing to look at our objective lens, there's more useful information written right on the barrel. The working distance refers to the distance between the front lens of the objective and the cover slip when the sample is in focus. Um, and cover slip thickness refers to the thickness of the cover slip that the objective is designed for. So I've got a little diagram here to show you what I mean. Um, so you can see we have an objective lens here. I drew in our little light path through the sample. Um, so the light's coming to focus right there at that cover slip sample interface. Um, and so you can see there that the working distance is that distance between that front lens element of the objective and the top of your cover slip. And then that cover slip thickness um, standard is 0 0.17 millimeters. If you're ordering cover slips, that's the number one and a half cover slip. Um, and so that means the distance between the actual objective and your sample is that working distance, in this case, one millimeter, um, plus that cover slip thickness, uh, 0 0.17 millimeters. Um, tube length is another important value listed on the objective barrel. That refers to the distance between the back focal lens of the objective and the eyepiece, and is therefore going to be dependent upon the way your microscope is designed. So if you see in the diagram here, um, microscopes are typically either finite corrected or infinity corrected. Um, and what that means is either um, the light is converging through that tube length distance or um, it's designed to have a, uh, a parallel light beam, which um, creates what's called infinity space. Um, and therefore, you can have um, some, some, some variable distances um, within your microscope. This also makes it very easy if you do need to add additional optics um, or um, uh, any other sort of additional optical element into your light path. It won't introduce any artifacts if you've got this infinity space in your microscope. But it is very important then that the objective uh, is designed for either um, uh, receiving light um, through uh, um, a parallel light beam at that back focal plane, or um, uh, the light will be um, uh, focusing uh, through that lens at the, the correct angle to uh, achieve that tube length distance and, um, and come into focus in the right place. The objective type is also listed on the objective. What this refers to is if there are any corrections in place for different optical aberrations, like um, field flatness correction or spherical aberration or chromatic aberration corrections. Um, you can see my table um, tells you what this language means. Um, so if you see the term plan uh, in your on, written on your objective barrel, uh, 
um, you know that there is some correction for field curvature. I'll explain what field curvature here is on the next slide. Um, and then there's also um, uh, the A chromat that has um, some chromatic aberration correction, but no spherical aberration correction. Uh, the fluorite lenses, um, which have some chromatic and some spherical aberration correction. Um, and then the apochromat that has the most um, spherical and chromatic aberration correction. Um, and I'll explain what each of those things are here. So um, commonly, if you think about a curved lens, what you're going to get is a nice sharp focus at the center of your field of view, um, and then some, some blurring. It looks kind of like a fishbowl effect, um, unless you have extra lenses in place to help flatten that out. Um, and that's what we, what we mean when we refer to um, uh, a flat field or a flat field correction. So um, unless you're planning to really um, only look at the very center part of your image, um, you really want uh, to use an objective that is a plan, plan objective. Two other aberrations I want to talk about are spherical aberration and chromatic aberration. Um, and these refer to how those rays of light actually form that tight focus. Um, so in a lens that has spherical aberration, um, most lenses do. It's why you have to have multiple lens elements um, to uh, get a nice tight focus. Um, that just means that your rays of light are going to bend um, uh, different amounts through the lens. So you can see in the diagram here that the rays of light passing through the center of the lens come to focus much deeper than the rays of light that are focusing through the edges of the lens, the peripheral rays. Um, and so if you want to get a nice tight focus, a nice tight focal spot, which you do, um, you'll have to have some extra lens elements in place. Um, and that's why it's important that you look at getting, um, you know, a fluorite or an, um, um, an apochromatic lens. Uh, now, chromatic aberration refers to um, how the different colors focus. So you're going to get a nice tight focal spot um, with your blue light, a nice tight focal spot with your green light, and a nice tight focal spot with your red light, but all those focal positions are at different places. So if you are trying to do any sort of co-localization, um, you're going to have um, a, a, a mismatch, um, sometimes in X and Y, but most commonly in Z, um, so in that, that focal position. Um, so it might look like that your sample is nicely in focus in the green channel and then in the blue channel it's out of focus and you have to refocus to capture the blue channel. Um, and so that's why it's important that you do, um, uh, that you are aware of how your light is being focused chromatically if you are trying to do any sort of co-localization study um, or um, if you just you know want to capture a nice image in one go without having to refocus over and over again. More important text that you'll find on the barrel of your objective is um, the immersion medium that the objective is designed to be used with. If it doesn't say any immersion medium, it's probably a dry lens. Um, but a lot of lenses are designed to be used with um, either immersion oil or immersion water. Um, and that just couples that front lens to the cover slip so that um, the light refracts in a very specific way as it's traveling from the objective to the sample. Uh, and then um, you also might see um, uh, a specialized optical property listed, like the lens here says DIC8. That means it's designed to be used with um, differential interference contrast. Um, sometimes uh, your lens will say, you know, phase contrast or, you know, pH1 or pH2 or something. Um, and that just tells you what phase rings it's designed to be used with, what phase ring it has installed in it. Um, so that can also be uh, really useful information. So I just want to talk a little bit about immersion medium. Um, this is really important if you want to capture more light with your lens. Um, because air has the lowest refractive index, 1.0, um, you are you're you're having a fairly extreme bend of light when it passes from the glass cover slip into the air um, and then from the air back into that um, uh, that glass front lens of your objective. So by using something with a higher refractive index uh, like water or glycerol or silicon, um, you're able to actually capture more light because the light will bend less at that refractive index interface. Um, 
That said, uh, if the lens is not designed to be used with immersion oil or immersion water or immersion glycerol, it's not going to improve your image. You'll make it worse. So make sure that your lens does say specifically what immersion fluid it is designed to be used with um, and try to use um, uh, exactly what it's designed to be used with. Um, different companies even you know, make their own proprietary immersion fluid with a very specific refractive index. So you can get um, immersion oil with refractive index 1.515 compared to 1.518. Uh, which sounds fairly insignificant, but if you are looking at very, very small features, you will see it. Uh, I also want to talk about depth of field. It's not actually usually written on the objective anywhere, um, but it's also really important. So those high NA lenses are going to have um, a very small depth of field, and the low NA lenses will have a very large depth of field. Um, where this becomes important is um, when you're trying to bring your sample into focus, um, you will bring more features into focus simultaneously with a low NA lens, um, which can be good and bad, depending on you know, the image that you're trying to collect. Um, so if you're trying to uh, look at your, you know, your thin tissue section, seven microns thick, and you just want a nice, um, well-focused image, it's nice that that depth of field is large, because if you do have a little bit of... Um, sample flatness issues in your mounting, um, it will be a little bit more forgiving. While a high NA lens, you will very, very obviously see any uh, any mounting issues you might have had where parts of the, the tissue are, are out of focus and it's difficult to bring the whole sample into focus simultaneously. Um, but if you are trying to image, you know, uh, very small details, possibly inside some live cells or something, you're going to want that high NA lens um, in order to see see those small details um, uh, without um, bringing too many things into focus at once. And I think that the, the large cluster of nuclei in this image does a good job demonstrating that, um, but it's hard to pick a point to draw an arrow to, to, to show that. So I chose instead this little out of focus um, nucleus next to this very nicely in focus nucleus where in the uh, image on the left with the um, lowest NA you can see there's this blurry out of focus uh, nucleus that is within our, our depth of field while in the um, highest NA the NA 1.4 uh, image you can see that that's completely eliminated um, because it is not within the depth of field um, so I feel like this does a pretty good job demonstrating how um, depth of field can be important, um, but really, if you if you look at that cluster of cells, you can also um, see where um, it can be um, nice to have you know more information with that lower NA lens of more things in focus at the same time. Um, although it does you know let in a lot more out of focus blurring, so maybe it's better to have the um, slightly more optically sectioned image. It just depends on 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 your needs um, for your uh, your your image analysis. All right, now we're going to talk about cameras. So um, the camera is what you'll use to actually capture your image. Obviously, you can just look down the eyepieces, um, but if you want to capture an image in order to do data analysis, you will need some sort of camera. Um, so. Um, Typical cameras are uh, charge coupled devices. Um, so the photons are collected by um, the camera array um, and there they are converted to electrons. Those electrons are then converted to a proportional voltage, uh, which uh, is then transmitted to an analog to digital converter, which converts that voltage value to the um, signal amplitude, which is uh, step sized according to the bit depth of the um, of the camera. So if it's an 8-bit camera um, and you only collect a very small number of photons, um, you'll be down around a signal value of 0, 1, 2. Um, if there's a very, very, very high number of photons collected by that pixel, um, you'll be up around you know, 250, 254, um, or the maximum value uh, will be 255. Um, bit depth. Um, and at some point, you'll have 
so many photons that it will just default to 255 because there isn't a higher value and that's called saturation. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, so we like to talk about um, charge couple device readout um, because that is where the um, speed of the camera comes from. It comes from that readout time. Um, so depending on how the camera reads out its frame, it could be fairly fast or it could be fairly slow. Um, most EMCCDs use a frame transfer. So they collect a frame and then transfer all of their their bucket brigade, like we saw in the previous slide, um, to a whole second chip and then read that chip out while they're capturing um, the capture frame over again. Um, it's also common for to use like an interline transfer um, where um, you've got your capture pixels and then adjacent pixels that you read out from. Uh, the downside of this obviously being light that you may lose um, by having those, those blank pixels immediately next to the capture pixels. So what we've done to kind of get around that um, with these, these interline uh, transfer uh, CCDs is we use a micro lens. And the micro lens then can focus extra light down onto the, um, the active pixels that are, are, that are capturing photons um, that um, you might have missed otherwise by having the adjacent pixel um, be, be an empty pixel, a transfer pixel. Now, typically in fluorescence microscopy, we just use a monochrome camera. Um, because we've got that filter cube in place, so we know what the color is and we can always false color the images later um, to whatever color we want. So if we were imaging Fitzy and we want it to look green, we can tell the software later to make our, our grayscale image look green. Um, but uh, you might want to use a color camera, um, especially if you're doing just like bright field imaging, H&E, DAB, you need that color information. And so um, what color cameras do is they take four monochrome pixels and they put in front of those four pixels um, a Bayer culture, color filter. Um, and so you can see it there uh, in um, the image marked B. Um, it's got two green pixels, a red pixel and a blue pixel. Um, and that's how that camera then um, determines the color value uh, in your image. Um, so if you need color and speed, this is good. You can use it with one of those um, like dual cubes or triple cubes. Um, it will be very, very fast. However, if you can collect one color at a time, the monochrome camera will give you so much more signal and more pixels. So there are some numbers we like to talk about when we talk about cameras, pixel size and number. So is this a five megapixel camera? Um, and therefore then how, how big are those pixels? Um, that it will obviously uh, change based on your um, uh, objective that you use. And if you have that, that 10x lens in front of the camera, um, like you typically do, uh, and you've got to obviously then, that's why you've got to measure that with a, um, like a stage micrometer to find out what that pixel size is. I'm gonna talk about that more here in a minute. Uh, quantum efficiencies. So this refers to the fraction of photons that are actually hitting the CCD and get converted to electrons. Obviously, you want all of the photons that hit the CCD to get converted to electrons, but some cameras do a better job than others. Um, EMCCDs are typically very good at this, 95% quantum efficiency, um, but other cameras will give you, um, you know, maybe maybe only 60 or 70% quantum efficiency. So um, if you're looking at your camera, it's good to know how many of the photons um, that are hitting the camera are you actually going to uh, going to see converted into, um, into signal in your image. Um, full well depth, this refers to the total number of electrons that can be recorded to pixel. Um, so that refers to what that, um, that saturation number. So on an 8-bit camera, um, you can only collect 0 to 255 gray levels. Um, and then any more electrons above a certain point just get capped and you're just going to get signal of 255 gray levels. You're going to saturate your image. So it's important to think about, um, you know, where that, that, that dynamic range is, and that's your full well depth. Um, read noise. So this is um, when you're reading out the signal from the camera, um, the noise that gets added in, that's that, that conversion to voltage, and then the voltage conversion to bit depth. You'll get, you'll get read noise as you're moving those electrons across. Um, which can uh, look like even though maybe you're in a very dim area of your sample, um, you might get some, some electrons jumping around um, 
causing this um, these noisy pixels in your image that that aren't real signal. Um, dark current, which I'm not going to talk about because it's fairly negligible in most biological applications, and then readout time. So if you're trying to do very fast imaging, like video rate imaging, um, if you do have a slow readout time of your camera, um, you might only be able to image at 10 frames per second, even though you want to image at 30 frames per second. And there are some things you can do to increase your readout time. We'll talk about that as well. So I want to talk a little bit more about those first two number, numbers, pixel size and number. Um, because this comes to um, uh, Nyquist sampling. And what I mean by Nyquist sampling is how many pixels we actually need in order to um, uh, see that the features we want to see in our image. So we talked about resolution quite a bit. Um, high NA lenses will give you better resolution than low NA lenses, and therefore high NA lenses will require more pixels um, so that you can actually see that, that information than, um, than, than the low NA lenses. So um, what you can see here is um, we've got three sine waves, um, and the first sine wave was sampled at a rate of, we'll call it F, um, and so you can see when you reconstruct that image, um, you don't actually get a sine wave, you just get a line, because it just wasn't sampled uh, with nearly enough pixels. Um, now, if we were to sample it at 2F, you would get something actually pretty close to the sine wave that you had before. Um, you see that nice zigzag there at B um, that gives you um, a pretty nice representation of, um, of your, your sine curve. Um, but if, if you kind of sample like uh, the example of 4F over 3, um, you can get kind of weird effects, and that's called aliasing. So how do we know how we need to sample our image? So um, Nyquist tells us what we need is about 2.3 pixels per resolution unit in order to optimally sample our image. So if you know the resolution of your objective, which you should do, um, you want to capture about 2.3 pixels per resolution unit. unit. Um, so you could, do, you could do a little bit more than that, especially if you're going to do a technique like deconvolution later. You'll probably need more like 5 to maybe even 10 pixels per resolution. Um, but uh, you really don't want to capture much less than that because you're going to lose a lot of features. Um, so it's just something to be thinking about. This is something you're not going to have a ton of control over in a fluorescence microscope, um, but you will be able to change your... Um, your number of pixels a little bit through um, a feature called binning, which I'll talk more about here shortly. Um, so the next value I wanted to talk about was read noise. So this is um, it's just inherent in reading out any CCD. Um, it scales as the square root of uh, readout speed. So the faster the camera is going to be reading, the noisier the image is going to be. Um, so by increasing your exposure time, you'll have less noise in your image. Another number I wanted to talk about is the full well depth. Um, so this will look like saturation in your image. So I'm bringing this image back up again of um, uh, the cluster of nuclei that I captured with a low NA and a high NA objective. And you can see even though I did turn the exposure time on the camera down with that highest NA lens, I didn't even turn it down enough. If you look within that orange circle, you can see an area um, where um, the features uh, kind of blur out at that brightest white pixel intensity. Um, and that's because I've saturated the camera there. It can't capture um, that information because there is too much light. Um, and so it's just giving me that maximum intensity value for all of, all, of those, um, all of those pixels, even though there are different features with different intensities there because I have saturated that camera. Um, and so the, the next value I wanted to talk about was signal to noise ratio. So signal refers to the number of photons. Um, and as I mentioned before, that gets um, converted to electron, that then gets converted to a voltage, that then gets converted to a pixel value, a pixel um, intensity value that we call signal. Um, but in theory, it's proportional back to that number of photons. Uh, noise um, is going to be the square root of the read noise squared plus the number of photons. Um, so it's really going to be uh, dependent on that, that read noise in the camera. Um, and so a low photon count uh, will be dominated by read noise. 
Um, but obviously a high photon count, um, you will see less noise in your image. Um, so if you think about it, if you, you double your signal to noise ratio, um, it means you have to either acquire for four times as long, um, so increase your exposure time four times, um, or um, you can actually bin two by two pixels together. And I, I mentioned binning earlier, I'm gonna talk about it now. So, so binning is, is very good if you have very, very dim samples, because what, it, what you can do is you can actually um, take the signal level from four of your pixels uh, and, and read it out as one pixel. So what you're sacrificing here is some of your spatial resolution um, in order to get more signal in your image. Um, but this can be really useful for very dim samples. This can also be very useful if you happen to know that you are already oversampling your image quite a bit. You already have plenty of pixels, um, so you can throw some of that spatial resolution away. Um, maybe you know that you happen to be um, sampling at a rate of, you know, five five pixels per resolution unit, you can easily do a two by two bin and still be above that 2.3 at 2.5 uh, pixels per resolution. So um, it can be a really good option for those um, dim, uh, dim samples. Um, also, uh, the camera will read out a little bit quicker, which is nice. So um, you can gain a little bit of speed there as well. Um, so most cameras on microscopes these days are either EMCCDs or SCMOSs. So I'm just going to talk uh, a little bit about the difference between these two. So an EMCCD is just a fast, noisy CCD. Um, typically runs around 30 frames per second, um, but then there's an amplification process. So the signal gets multiplied up by like 100 fold, which um, uh, will cut your read noise down, which is great. Um, but it does add an additional Poisson noise, so it's not, not perfect. Um, upside is you get to image very, very fast without worrying about that read noise. Um, so these are kind of um, the most sensitive cameras um, on the market right now. So if you do have very dim samples that you need to image quickly, uh, an EMCCD is probably going to be your, your best bet. And now the CMOS camera, these are very, very fast cameras. Um, you'll you'll hear of SC mosses that run at 500 frames per second, and the way they get that speed is in addition to converting the photons to electrons at each pixel within the camera, they also do that conversion to the voltage right there at the pixel. There isn't that bucket brigade readout like I talked about earlier with CCD cameras, um, which is very very fast, uh, and so you're able to image much more quickly. What do you lose with the SCMOS is you um, you lose some of your sensitivity um, because there's a lot more electronics around each individual pixel for that to happen. Um, and so we combine them with micro lenses so that we're able to capture more of that light because um, uh, without the micro lens, we lose about 70% of the light with all that stuff around the sensor. Um, so these cameras have become much more usable now with the addition of micro lenses, although they are still not nearly as sensitive as uh, EMCCDs. So comparing CCDs to CMOSs, um, CMOS sensors are generally more susceptible to noise um, because they have several transistors located near each pixel. Um, the light sensitivity, will be, light sensitivity will be much lower even with the micro lenses because um, you lose a lot of photons that just hit the transistors instead of the photodiodes. Um, and then CCDs, on the other hand, they consume a lot more power. They regularly have to be cooled um, because they'll run very, very hot. Um, so if you really, really need speed and you have very bright samples, CMOSes are the way to go. Um, if you have dim samples, and um, they can still run very fast. 30 frames per second is video rate. Um, but it just depends on, you know, the dynamic process that you're trying to study, how much speed you really need. So some practical imaging advice. Um, always be sure to check your actual image histogram. So in pretty much all imaging software that I have used, you can bring up um, an intensity histogram for all of the pixels in your image. Um, and so if you look at that top image, you can see that we're really using the full dynamic range of the camera really well. Um, we've got quite a few dark pixels, which is why the peak is down at the darker end of that spectrum. Um, 
but then uh, we still have quite a few bright pixels and even some white pixels vary up at, at that kind of top saturation point of the camera. So that top image is doing a really nice job using that full dynamic range of the camera. Um, the second image, you might say, well, it looks basically the same. And that's because our eyes can actually only see about 100 gray levels. Um, but if you're going to go back and then try to analyze this data later, you're going to find the top image a lot easier to set up thresholds to do your image analysis than the, than the bottom image. Um, another point about looking at these image histograms, something that you can see is that um, even though there are some very dark areas, um, there are no zero pixels. Um, so you always need to think about your black level or your offset. Uh, and this is why when you are doing that image analysis later on, it's really important that you do that background subtraction to make sure that you are um, that your zero really is zero. Uh, even if you capture zero pixels, you're going to get a little bit of noise and um, your black level is not necessarily going to be perfectly at, at zero. So just some things to think about when you are um, capturing your image. Look at that. Look at that um, histogram. Also, you might think, you know, I've got live cells. And I would rather keep my light level low, and I don't necessarily need my full all of all of these um, gray levels, uh, especially if you've got you know like a 16-bit camera that's got 65,000 gray levels. You might realize that when you're doing your analysis, you can get away with 5,000 gray levels, and that's still heaps. Back when we had only 8-bit cameras, we had only 255 gray levels to work with. Uh, so it's really important that we use this full dynamic range. But now with these 16-bit cameras, um, you can get away with less. So collect some images, start working on your analysis early, uh, and then you'll know what you actually need um, and what will keep your cells happy and alive. Okay, so now I've kind of touched on all of the components in the fluorescence microscope. What are some advantages of doing fluorescence microscopy? So one of the big advantages of fluorescence microscopy is that it is a quantitative technique. And so what that means is um, your staining does equate to, to higher protein expression levels, which is fantastic if um, you want to show that protein A um, maybe um, is expressed more with this drug treatment than without this drug treatment. You're able to actually do those kinds of measurements. Um, it's got higher contrast than your standard bright field techniques. Um, there's usually better cameras, get better images. Um, it does require controls, although so do bright field techniques. It's important that you do controls. Um, but then this is due to, to, to lamp and laser variation. So um, we're going to talk a lot about those controls during the sample prep talks. Um, so I'm not going to spend um, any time on that here. But um, just be aware that it is very important that you do uh, those controls to um, if you want to be able to say that you know you have higher expression um, in some sort of quantitative way. Uh, additionally, you can do multiple colors on um, a single sample. Um, I know in theory you could do you know a couple colors, a couple colors of DAB. I think there's a red DAB and a blue, brown DAB and maybe a black DAB. I don't remember, um, but um, I've never found those to work particularly well. Well, with fluorescence, we regularly do three, four, five color imaging, and we can actually multiplex up to seven populations at SNM. Um, this is really useful if you're trying to, uh, you know, if your tissue is really, really precious uh, and you can't, you know, just keep flying through tissue to do, um, you know, one, one protein, one piece of tissue that can um, really fly through tissue very quickly that way. Uh, additionally, it gives you slightly better resolution than, um, than bright field techniques. Um, we talked about that a little bit. Um, and it directly links to some other, um, you know, more advanced techniques like super res, turf, flim, frap, flip, FCS, FCCS. Pretty much if you see any of those F acronyms, um, it's probably talking about fluorescence microscopy technique. So what are the limitations of fluorescence microscopy? Um, I'm going to spend a little time talking about them, and this will directly link into the rest of my talk, which is about confocal microscopy. So one of the big limitations of fluorescence microscopy is you are going to excite through um, the entire thickness of the sample um, above and below that focal plane. Um, and therefore, if you do have a thicker sample, you're going to get a lot of out of focus fluorescence, um, which is going to decrease the contrast of your image and cause a lot of blurring. Um, also, if you're trying to do a co-localization study, 
um, what you'll find is, you know, you won't necessarily be able to tell if the protein of interest, um, the two proteins of interest are in the same place. Maybe one is above um, the other protein of interest. So it's really important that if you are imaging thicker samples, um, you find a, a technique that will give you some sort of optical section capability. And that brings us around to confocal microscopy. So in confocal microscopy, we place a pinhole in front of the detector, thereby eliminating um, any of the out-of-focus fluorescent light from reaching the detector. And that's how we're able to achieve that optical sectioning by only collecting light from the focal plane. And I'm going to talk about that in a lot more detail now. So this little diagram um, gives you a little comparison of wide field versus confocal microscopy. Um, from like a component standpoint. So wide field, we'll use like a, a lamp, typically like a mercury lamp, although now we're using a lot more LEDs. Well, confocal uses lasers um, because instead of illuminating the whole sample simultaneously, we point scan the sample. We point scan that laser across the sample to build up an image um, by raster scanning that laser across. Um, so instead of talking about exposure times of, you know, 50 milliseconds, we talk about, you know, the exposure time at each individual pixel, like two microseconds per pixel um, as you're scanning very fast. Um, in wide field microscopy, we use cameras, typically CCD cameras, sometimes as CMOSes, as we mentioned, um, but with confocal, we use individual photomultiplier tubes. Um, so it's just, again, capturing light from that single point um, many times over and over as you're scanning to then build up an image. Um, wide field, there's no removal of that out-of-focus light, while with confocal, we get this nice um, optical sectioning ability.